Pause. Silence. Let's reconvene in person again to reconnect, to tell our stories, to listen, to disarm ourselves of preconceived notions, to reframe, to reflect, to unplug. Welcome to Hashtag Unplugged 22. Take a victory lap. High five a friend. This is your moment, our moment. Together, we unplug to connect again and remember why we started. Let's evaluate our community and our digital impact as quality conversations rooted in context. We are about real connections that translate into real life action. Brought to you by Jam Lab Africa and the Civic Tech Innovation Network. Uh, good morning, everyone, um, and a warm welcome to the Civic Tech Innovation Forum, uh, co-hosted with Jamfest, um, under the theme hashtag unplugged. Um, my name is Jody Alamea. Uh, I'm an independent consultant in working in urban development and municipal governance. And today I'm facilitating the session under the theme working with cities, the unfolding role of technology meets government in urban development. There's a couple of housekeeping rules. I think most of us by now know uh, to sort of keep ourselves muted and, and with this platform that we're using, you're muted on entry. Um, there's a really fantastic Q&A function and chat function and poll function and all sorts of things on the right-hand side. And we encourage you to please use that. Um, and uh, the speakers will also be using it to keep it sort of quite dynamic and, and engaging as we go along. Um, we unfortunately don't have interpretation for this session, so uh, it will only be available in English. Um, and the session is also being recorded and will be published on uh, the uh, CTIF um, uh, forums and platforms uh, after the fact. So if you want to share it on your social media platforms and things like that afterwards, please do using the hashtag CTIF2022 or CTIF22 and hashtag unplugged. A um, little bit about the topic for today. Um, <clears throat> I suppose the, the sort of broad problem statement that we're dealing with is that cities around the world, and in particular African cities, dealing with the context that we are and the speakers that, that we have are most familiar with, are dealing with a broad range of challenges. Um, historic challenges that we're familiar with, as well as new challenges relating to climate change, rapid development, um, disruptions from technology, polarization, all sorts of things. Um, and also, you know, fantastic opportunities in, in terms of how our economies and populations and, and the way in which we develop a sort of sh shift and change in, in the face of this. There's a, a, I suppose, a, a belief amongst the speakers that are here today that uh, technology has a role to play in um, responding to these challenges and supporting these opportunities but that the policy environment is not necessarily aligned to supporting these emerging technology solutions and that the speed of innovation is maybe happening a little bit faster than what traditional bureaucratic systems uh, can cope with. Um, and so there's a, a, a sort of a traditional role of doing development and service delivery um, that presents a, a barrier uh, to the use of technology and innovation. Um, enter civic technology uh, champions. Um, so this session explores the role of, of civic technology as it relates to partnering with government, partnering with civic um, civil society actors, partnering with academia and private sector and other actors to support a more sustainable and equitable urban development uh, agenda and to support the needs, uh, capacities, uh, systems and processes of local government in Africa uh, to adopt technology and innovation in a manner that is appropriate um, and suitable for, for context. Not, uh, not to say that, you know, we should be technology um, uh, uh, sort of 
gurus for the sake of it, um, but you know, sort of fit for purpose and and, and appropriate to context. Um, the broad agenda is we're going to have a couple of presentations from our speakers. We have Richard Hevers from Open Cities Lab, Constant Cap from Code for Africa, and Wesley Depoko from Fast Camp Company, as well as other roles. He's recently launched a platform called Lunta, which he'll also speak to. Um, and after those presentations, we're going to have a, a conversation. I'll facilitate the conversation. I've got a couple of questions, but please also put your questions into the chat and, and we'll introduce those into, into the discussion. Um, we have uh, just a, just about an hour for this conversation, but I think the session after this starts an hour and a half. So if there is really active dialogue, we might run a little bit over, but we'll see how we're doing for time. Um, with that, we'll dive straight in to Richard. Um, Richard is the founder and director of Open Cities Lab, and he'll tell us a little bit more about Open Cities Lab's role and uh, approach to this challenge of uh, civic technology and urban development in South Africa. Thanks, Richard. Thanks so much, Teddy. Just gonna pull my slides up. So thank you so much for um, having me in the session. Uh, really looking forward to listening and learning from what we have going on. Um, as Jody said, my name is Richard Givers. I'm the executive director of Open Cities Lab. And just a note that if you want to get any of the information on these slides or links that are included in them, there's a bit.ly link at the bottom corner. So bit.ly forward slash OCL CTIF22. Um, and you'll see that repeated on these. So I think um, in terms of working with cities, Open Cities Lab has been working within and sort of rooted in the open data and civic tech space for the past eight years. Um, and we believe that through empowering citizens, building trust and accountability in the civic space and building capacity within government, we will enable participation in decision making, evidence-based urban intervention and inclusive co-design that will improve the lives of residents in urban spaces. So I think one of the most important first elements that we found as we came through this journey of trying to understand how to really build a robust participatory democracy and inclusion within the space um, is that one needs to work from in a complex space from multiple angles. And so a lot of uh, you know the way that we formed our approach was to look at how one can both work from within citizen empowerment, work within the government and governance systems, and then also look at the civic space and everything from hard infrastructure to placemaking to social fabric. Um, we also very much uh, realized that it has to be a multidisciplinary approach. And so civic technology is a critical part of our delivery mechanism. But a lot of what we realized was that it need there needs to be a demand pull and there needs to be a user a user user focus around government users around citizen citizens CSO resident users if we're going to improve this ability for us to create vibrant and dynamic spaces and so this mix of capacity building with civic technology with policy action research and strategy support civic data science and sort of user engagement is a critical mix when it comes to working within the space. I think to try and frame the problem, um, you know, as Jody says, you, we found that a lot of the impact space or the space around civic technology was very much focused on, um, was sometimes focused on tech solutionism, but also on a top-down approach in terms of this idea of working at a sort of regional national level. But cities are the place where people are most connected to government. They're the place where, wherever you're talking about it, any sort of service delivery or infrastructure development, there is the most um, connection and, and potential ability to have impact. And one doesn't, and, and, and at a city level, there is scale enough to have impact and also to repeat things, solutions and ideas that come across, you know, to other cities in the world and especially the continent. But also there, there's a level of not needing to lose your uniqueness or complexity. Um, because of having to work at a national level. So, I mean, you know, just focusing on the fact that there's a, there's a difficulty with evidence-based decision-making around city stakeholders in, in South Africa and Africa, um, leading to reduced service delivery and compromised livelihoods. 
Um, but I think there's a lot from a systemic place, from a capacity place, from a ability to connect place. Um, that means that the environment that city governments are operating within and city and urban spaces are operating within, uh, you know, have insufficient ability to provide clarity and strategy, um, leading to internal frustration inside governments, internal frustration inside community groups, CSOs and residents, um, and then working on and eroding that trust that exists. Um, so I think, you know, one of the critical areas of change that we try to focus on when we're working with cities and approaching this idea around where intervention within um, digital or innovation spaces can lead to better decision making and better connection. Um, uh, you know, we're looking at um, improving the the sort of data and go governance and data capacity within city institutions and CSOs. So I think there's definitely a focus on the fact that every city or urban context is unique. And so, you know, cities themselves have different levels of digital uh, and technical and data maturity, even within their own departments, um, and especially from city to city. And the ecosystem within a city around civil society and communities is also um, needs a unique response. So it doesn't mean that you have to recreate or reinvent the wheel technology-wise, but it means that similar technology and analytics and these sorts of things need to be applied in a way that is very much fitting the complex and environment of maturity, understanding and literacy and power dynamics within that city environment. And so very often our interventions within maybe a mature space in the government or states you know, side will involve interventions around data analytics, uh, more advanced technology, um, more evidence-based decision-making that makes its way up into policy and strategy. Uh, if there's a less of a mature space within the government area, the focus is very much on capacity building and building champions and, and, and sort of realizing this idea around evidence-based change and the, the role of technology and data in that. Um, similar within the CSO environment, you get many CSOs that um, work with communities on critical service delivery issues, on participation or inclusion issues um, at varying levels of maturity around that. And especially when you find an, a, a space, you know, for example, um, perhaps in a city, the human settlement space within the government side is not in a data or digital maturity space. Um, often a very good, you know, the intervention needs to be uh, collaborative, working with CSOs, um, to build capacity of data governance, holding government account and sort of working within this complex environment. So I think these areas of change around sort of data governance and data capacity building within these city institutions, CSOs, increasing civic engagement around or amongst residents, um, but really uh, actually building participation or the ability to be involved in decision making and then looking at strengthening the urban data ecosystem in cities um, very much comes into the approach. Um, but I think, you know, it's better to hear it from the sort of user case and all of this can be a little bit high level. So, you know, some of these examples of the, the, the things we're working on is, um, you know, city employees saying our reporting is manual, they're collecting data through WhatsApp messages and trying to capture this manually on a spreadsheet. How can we intervene and create um, a system around better data ingestion and, and being able to analyze this data better. Um, you know, civil society organization, um, you know, might be doing cutting edge work in terms of monitoring of activity of cities, but the output is in PDF reports that are inaccessible to the public and other stakeholders. How can we create an intervention technology wise um, and effectively communicate with city planners, citizens, and, and lead to more of that ecosystem strengthening how do we, you know, if a city leadership, how do we develop, um, you know, information tools that help, um, help understand and prioritize service delivery backlogs, especially with a focus on marginalized communities or vulnerable hidden communities? Um, and how do we go direct to citizens when it comes to civic engagement, like being able to know who they're able to vote for in a election? So in my last slide, you know, um, just wanted to show some practical examples of what we do. Um, on the top left, uh, you'll see uh, the SCOTA platform, which is an intervention around sharing information and city information um, 
the sort of open data portal, but also, um, and on the bottom right, you'll also see the Durban Edge portal, which is a city focused portal, which offers data for, for data users, but also interpretation dashboards and data stories to help in that Durban Edge example, build e better economic decision-making both within government, but within uh, business and communities and stakeholders around economic data. You'll see, check it on the bottom right, a collaboration with um, violence prevention through urban upgrading, as well as planning for informality and uh, in a collaboration um, with Central Institute. And these are where we're working with CSOs um, to help understand the env environments around informal settlements and, and in in certain examples, hoping we can link government to citizens by, for example, empowering people to collect data on wash facilities and having that data piping straight through to city systems into the maintenance data and analytics um, and service request um, areas within the city so that both citizens are trained and, and build capacity around service delivery um, requirements and requests. Their needs in terms of critical basic rights are also, you know, becoming data and becoming open and, and understandable. Um, but also, this is directly piped with into, into government systems and connected so that this is available for city decision makers to, again, prioritize and work with and, you know, focusing on, on marginalized communities to get service delivery. We have toolkits like this one um, we present here on Intact, which is an open data guide for cities. Um, which talks a lot about a lot of more examples than I can get to now, and I encourage you to go and check it out. But I think also just my final point is that a lot of this work, and within the civic tech or tech environment, a lot of this work is also, you know, not necessarily public. You know, when you're working on analytics plat like platforms within a government space to make informed decision making around um, water or infrastructure or housing, all these sorts of things. Um, you know, just want to speak to that that approach of this idea around urban tech and where the boundary or the frontier for civic tech opportunities are within the urban space. And I think it's where innovation and tech meets an urban context as well as civic tech. So for example, WhatsApp is an innovation um, and can be used in a civic tech context. Um, and when you're using, say, when a city creates an API that presents data on for example, service requests and a civic tech organization then takes that data from that API and creates a WhatsApp bot that um, is, again, a platform where you're meeting people where they are and they're able to engage with that information and understand uh, what's going on in terms of service delivery and, and service request updates um, through WhatsApp as a platform so that sort of mixture of innovation, urban context and civic tech leads you to this sort of urban tech and environment. So thanks. Um, you know, there's other things in here you can check out um, on that bit.ly link, but thank you very much and keen to chat. Um, thanks very much, Richard. I've popped that bit.ly link in the chat as well. So people can take a closer look. And I know you launched your new website on a session yesterday, so people can also have a look at your website for, for more details there. There's lots to pick up on there in terms of, you know, how do you pick up on that user demand so that you are responding to the pool instead of pushing a technology, meeting people where they are, um, yeah, finding those kind of data systems that are hidden away inside the more mature government organizations, but not necessarily... Uh, public and visible so that you can integrate them with more civic applications. So I think yeah, a lot to pick up there when we get into the discussions with the panel sessions. But I'm going to move on to Constant now um, so we can just learn a little bit more about what Constant is doing. Constant is based in Kenya, in uh, Nairobi, I believe, and working with Code for Africa. So over to you, Constant. Thank you very much. Uh... Yes, I can just to upload my presentation. Yeah, I hope we can all see it. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, wherever, whichever 
side of the world you are. My name is Constant Kapp. I'm a senior product manager at Code for Africa, which is a network of civic tech uh, data journalism labs with uh, in 21 countries on, on the African continent. So I'm in charge of a program called Census Africa, which is a remote uh, citizen science and remote sensing program that has mainly been dealing in matters of uh, environmental pollution in uh, different African cities. I'll focus a bit on the work we're doing in uh, in Nairobi, which has been around uh, the area of air quality, air quality moni monitoring. So a bit about myself, I'm an urban planner I and researcher, and I've been involved in urban development work from a uh, non-state non actors perspective doing a lot of advocacy work with place making public space environmental manager management and pushing for what we call the just city approach uh, in improving uh, urban mobility where we ensure that our cities are participatory inclusive um, democratic and and sustainable um, and we with particular focus to enable us to ensure that the voice of what we call the urban invisibles is taken into account because many times in our cities we have those people who are who never get to be heard you know uh, the poor persons with disabilities the elderly um, children etc and you know sometimes even uh, ordin ordinary citizens so of course you know as as we know um the future of cities uh, cities are as was said by richard you know cities are going are growth points and growth centers and these are the places that are going you, you know to be uh, centers of, the, of, of attention over the next uh, you know, century next couple of years on the african continent we have the highest you know what we could say the highest rate of urbanization we may not be as urbanized as area, other areas but you know we definitely you know are urbanizing at an extremely high speed and you know I, I, you know by 2050 2060 we'll, we'll be talking of uh, more than 50 percent of people living in urban, urban areas but you know the question is always are we ready for that and we keep asking ourselves that question as planners we keep asking ourselves that question as urban enthusiasts and urbanists you know, we have challenges of uh, urban administration we have challenges of uh, uh, urban planning urban development you know uh, within uh, our African cities and governments are, face challenges in meeting these particular demands and, ex and, and, and the expectations. Of course, you know, there are lots of problems in our, our cities. Um, and you, you, the first one we can talk about, we all know, is, is corruption and, and mismanagement that has uh, hit many of our municipal governments or our county governments or local governments. But, uh, you know, coupled with that are problems of poverty, problems of uh, urban inequalities that I will explain a bit briefly in the next slide, environmental pollution, um, air pollution being one of the fastest growing problems in uh, our cities, solid waste management being a continuous problem, as well as, you know, lack of public space um, and, and, and poor, you know, poor urban mobility systems that continue to, uh, to to be challenges within within uh, African African cities in particular you know are the urban inequalities and I, I like showing this particular uh, satellite image of a section of Nairobi where that has three different neighborhoods you know Madare uh, to the south of the image Muthaiga to the north of the image and high range of parklands to the west of the image. So in the south of the image, we have, you know, 1,700 people per hectare. In the north, you have seven people per hectare. And to the east, to the west, sorry, you have 70 people per hectare. So you see those kind of you know, visible inequalities. And these inequalities are extended to other areas. You know, they're extended to urban mobility. They're extended to environmental management. They're extended to even the way the neighborhoods and areas are governed. Okay, if it, if I had the time, I would go much into much more details into some of some of those areas. But you know, in uh, we in as non-state actors, you know, have you know, sit down and ask us also, in what way can we make some form of contribution? And as Code for Africa, we've sat down and initiated, you know, doing making our contribution and make uh, both to government and to the citizens by looking at environmental 
uh, monitoring, you know, through means of citizen science. And we've started this, uh, we started with air, we're slowly going into water and sound, and you know, hopefully later on, if uh, need arises, we shall also go into, into radiation. So our air quality work has been, uh, you know, de uh, developed over the last four to, to five years, uh, where we develop our own kind of sensors. And, you know, we have uh, what you see on your left is an indoor air pollution sensor that we used for a research study on household air pollution. And to the right is an outdoor or ambient air pollution sensor. And we develop our own sensors and uh, partner with uh, both communities and uh, with the local government in, in doing air quality monitoring, uh, in particular monitoring particulate matter. These are very fine particles that we find in the, the air and smaller than the human, uh, than smaller than the width of a human hair, but penetrate into the bloodstream of human beings. So we are able to monitor uh, different levels of particulate matter in different parts of the cities through these and share these on an open data on a, on a platform, on a dashboard, as well as have a platform where people can, who, who are interested can be able to download uh, this data. We've also started uh, sending, sharing monthly reports on the state of air quality within some of the, the, the neighborhoods that we uh, that we're working with. Who are we working with? You know, uh, we're working, you know, with, uh, one, we're working with, uh, with the local government, in particular in the city of Nairobi, we've started, uh, we have a network with other people dealing with their quality work in which we ensure that we not over deploy sensors in certain areas so that we, uh, we don't end up doing double work as well as sharing the data with the city. Um, who else, you know, and, and, and then working also with communities who are affected by some of these uh, problems of, of, of air quality. That of course brings, they bring a challenge of conflict of interest at times. Um, I may have mentioned earlier on, you know, one of the challenges that we have within uh, our cities is also urban sprawl. So we found a situ uh, ourselves in situations where we have to also deploy monitors on the outskirts of the cities that are growing uh, quite fast as, you know, mixed use residential areas. And uh, many times, in some cases, you may find residential factories being given approvals next to residential areas and we have to help those communities monitor uh, <clears throat> monitor the quality of air and use that data to to showcase the problems. And we've also partnered with uh, journalists to do uh, stories on some of these um, uh, challenges and that has brought a lot of impact to the, uh, to the communities. And here we have, you know, just an, uh, an impression of, you know, one, one of where we have some of our sensors in different parts of Nairobi. I draw the red line because that shows kind of the divide between the city, um, the northwest of the city being more the, the more upmarket area and the south and the east being the more poorer area. And okay, the south, most of the south is, is of Nairobi is a, is a national park, as you can see with the white the empty space there. But uh, generally, you, you can tell that, you know, you can tell that the, the quality of air within, you know, the, central area which is more of an industrial uh, zone is a bit is, is not the best of quality and then as you move towards the more upmarket areas we end up having much better quality quality air um, we've worked with communities and we've initiated what we uh, call participatory mapping where we sit with uh, members of communities map out areas that they believe have problems and, and through that deploy some of these sensors and this in particular makes the lower end people from these lower income communities feel to be part and parcel of this particular uh, of these these projects and these uh, these deployments um, we believe that engaging communities in particular is, is, is also crucial because they understand what uh, the problems of the area and you know what what is interesting is just how in sync the data that the the, uh, the information they share with us uh, is uh, these are some examples of stories that we've uh, done with some journalists um, in identifying some of these challenges that have led to impact and also led to change in policy. And, and this particular story led to the gov uh, one of the governors shutting down some factories within his uh, his uh, constituency because they were polluting and having a negative impact on the people within 
that uh, that particular area. What's well, what's the way forward? You know, I think uh, well, we need to continue working, sharing this data, and also moving to other fields and other areas, and, and and not only looking at it from a problem perspective, but also from a positive point of view. Uh, we recently deployed a sens uh, some uh, sensors in different in green spaces as you know ways of also showcasing that this uh, information, uh, that these green spaces are critical for urban areas uh, and uh, for having more livable cities. Thank you very much. Thanks, Constant. That's that's great. I was trying to fiddle with some air quality data recently in Cape Town, so now I know where I'm going to send it to. Um, and such great impact stories there. And, you know, I think what really struck me is that you, you mentioned corruption in your government. And for me, one of the most fundamental prerequisites of if you're trying to encourage evidence-based decision-making and working with data and all of these things is that there is a willingness to make decisions, um, you know, based on sort of the, the right integrity and the right reasons. There isn't other interests that, that are driving decision-making. So you, you've presented a really good example of where there are other interests driving decision-making. You have to mobilize other tools like working with the media and working with community and things like that to to build the case and the interest to to sort of crowd out that, that, other, that other force. So that was such a powerful thing that I took away from your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Wesley. Uh, we, Wesley and I first met many, many years ago. We were both working on uh, something called the Open Data Forum, which was trying to drive the, the creation of the first open data policy in South Africa, which was in Cape Town. And at the time, Wesley was working in the mobility space with Go Metro, which itself has an interesting story of, I think, starting as a civic tech organization and becoming more of a private uh, sort of transport data company. Wesley is now the editor chief in chief of Fast Company South Africa, which documents um, innovation and technology stories, you know, quite agnostically, I think, to whether it's civic tech or academic or private. It's just what is the technology and what problem is it solving? And has recently launched his own platform called Lumtu. Um, so I think you'll you'll give quite a different perspective on this on this whole statement, you know, coming from private and civic and uh, storytelling kind of perspective. So Wesley, over, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Jody, and uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I think uh, I have basically three stories to, to, to share, and uh, I'm hoping that from that, one can sort of uh, get to learn some of the few things that I've experienced and, and really gather insights that hopefully can you know inspire and, and help us to, to 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 see how do we take care of uh, the challenges that we are faced with so i'm assuming that everyone can see my slide at this point so one of the interesting projects that i've worked on is uh, essentially around public transport and uh, Jody has mentioned that I've worked with GoMetro. And that's the first story I just want to tell, or at least share. And the story there is, is, is very simple. Yeah, or at least it highlights the value of data, uh, essentially open data, and uh, how it can be used to build citizen information platforms. So the story goes like this, that an app was built um, I think in the early, around uh, about 2009, if not uh, 2010, somewhere there. But essentially, this platform was built to assist the citizens to have access to uh, data about public transport, uh, how trains are moving, how late they are, uh, when is the train going to arrive. So this was a very important information for citizens, at least at the time. A lot has changed since then. But the point I just want to highlight about this is that this data was essentially data that was sourced from a public entity, Transnet, or, the, or at least Prasa, as it was known then, that essentially governs or manages trains in South Africa. 
So Prasa had massive data about the movement of trains. And essentially, uh, you know, Gomento made use of this data to ensure that the public could have access to this information much better. And this is not to say um, uh, Prasa didn't have information published. It had published information using print material um, and, you know, yeah, essentially print material. You had those timetables that they would release, but those were dated. In other words, you couldn't really tell at the specific point in time uh, where the train, whether the train would come and at what point in time, how late it is and those kind of things. So the, the app that was developed by Comet was very useful in that sense. But I think essentially the fact that th this data was sourced from this public entity is quite an important one uh, for a number of reasons. Is that for me, it illustrates what happens when public entities release their data or find ways of releasing this data, which is also another interesting story in its own right. So um, having uh, been part of this process or studied how uh, Goldmetra has approached this for me has been interesting. And I think I just want to share one bit of information about it is that um, essentially uh, how, what happened is that Gometro initially pitched this to, 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 to Presa and, and Presa had to follow rules about uh, you know, releasing that data. And one of the few things they had to do was to go through a, a public uh, process that would ensure that everyone has an opportunity to, to participate. But uh, uh, what uh, Gometro did is that it's not to charge uh, Prasa for uh, you know, getting that, or at least for, 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 for this tender that was released. That, that was one thing that they did. In other words, uh, the, the whole thing was actually zero. And I suppose others that pitched had, uh, you know, given them sums of money to say, this is how much they would build this for. So essentially, Cometro, you know, got involved in this process for free. In other words, they, they, they didn't ask uh, sort of price to, to, to pay money. That's an interesting approach in its own right, I think. Um, but the point here about this really that I want to make about it is that there are challenges in accessing public data at times. Um, and there, there's needs for innovative ways of enabling access to public data, open data, so that citizens can access information. But more importantly, and I think there's so many things that can be done. And some of these things that can be done is, is creating uh, information platforms, or tools that can enable citizens to access data. Having worked in this environment, I've realized one thing, and what, what, what that is, is that in information platforms that we have, we tend to lack information about, um, you know, informal environments. And when, I, when we talk informal environments, we talk a number of things. We could be talking housing, we could be talking transport. And in the transport sector, one realized that taxis were not captured formally in a way that would enable citizens to know uh, about taxis or even governments for that matter to know about taxis and to understand how they move and that type of thing. So we embarked on a process of mapping uh, taxis in Cape Town and we developed a transit map um, which looks uh, like this. That was a very important uh, process as well. Uh, just you know, the, 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 the way you go about mapping public transport, um, you know, riding taxis all over Cape Town, using mobile phones to, to, to map and uh, transforming that data into dashboards at a later stage and essentially using that data to, 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 to better inform, you know, uh, regulators about uh, this industry. Now, we did. We created this map partly to illustrate what it looks like, which I think for me is also an important one. But we also created this map to help uh, you know people to know where they could find a taxi. Uh, you know, one of the few interesting things that I found about this this process was that there were places. I mean, everyone knows this, and people assume that taxis have no stops. But what I discovered is that there are specific stops uh, that probably are not formal in nature, but they are almost designed uh, by you know, pub, the public. Um, in, in Cape Town, in N1, there's a specific stop right about N1. If you look very carefully in this map, um, you will see that, that there's a stop there. And people literally stop in, at that place and they are able to, 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 to catch a taxi. That was interesting to learn. And I think this information at the later stage could inform uh, planners to, 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 to plan better. And, and, and to even designate takes, I mean, uh, taxi ranks at the right places where people are likely to be. Um, 
I think the, the, the one of the interesting things about the the the, the process that we we participated in, in as far as you know gathering data about taxis was this uh, information about taxi fares. This was I think around right about 2015 and from 2015 2016, where we as part of the map we also collected information about what it costs to ride a taxi from one place to the other. This information was useful for um, people who are riding taxis because there is no, you know, people just know by by heart that, okay, if you travel from Yanga to Belleville, this is how much it will cost you. Uh, but essentially to have something documented, uh, at least in, in paper or even in a mobile phone helps a lot, uh, especially for people who are traveling or people who are new in the area so that they can understand uh, how what what how that particular area works. So I've, I've mentioned a couple of things, but overall, I think this illustrates uh, what happens when we try and make data available, but also we, we generate our own data and how we can utilize that data for better use. And I think ultimately, uh, what one point I would like to say is that having seen what has happened with this particular company is that it is really moved from strength to strength in as far as using data. It's probably doing many, many other things today. But at, the, at that point in time, I, I felt that, you know, if we could approach this, if we, if we could approach things this way, in other words, public entities making their data available for businesses or information platforms to be built, it could make a huge difference in society. So there's a lot that I got to learn in the process of working uh, with GoMetro. And one of those things, or at least working with public transport as well, one of those things is that there's a, we lack a lot in as far as information that citizens can, can access, and particularly in township, which is why I've, I've started a process of working towards developing what I call a smart township in Selimbosh Kayaman. There are a couple of reasons why this is important for me, but one of them is that it is very important that we create a model of success, a model of what it looks like when technology, when data is applied in, in, in our local environments. And Kaimandi as a township is very unique in that. It's very close to one of the leading un universities in South Africa, uh, very much close to some of the leading business people, some of the leading tech companies in South Africa, um, and, and, and a community that lacks in so many ways, um, uh, all, but, but yet around this environment. So I, I felt that there was a need to start collaborating across government, across uh, institutions of higher learning, and really working with communities to build what I call a smart township, but also to help community itself to solve its own problems using data and technology. So the, the platform that Jody mentioned uh, earlier on um, is called Luntu. Uh, it's a platform that currently sources information about what is the dream of a Karamanji resident? Uh, what, what are their dreams? And understanding that for me is very important because it will inform us uh, about the, the solutions that we can develop for this environment. And hopefully whatever we do in this particular township, we can replicate to other townships. So essentially, this is a public platform that we're trying to create for, for Karamanji people to access information about education, about housing, about business, and, and all those kind of things. And yes, it's, it's, it's been great so far. Uh, there's, there's great collaboration across uh, you know, uh, the, the, the stakeholders, and we hope that more will come out of this. I think I'm going to stop there, and hopefully we can share some more later on uh, when we do uh, some question and answer session. Thank you. Thanks, Rizzi. Thanks, Rizzi. Um, um, there's so many different things to, to pull on there. Um, the, the one thing that kind of really strikes me between your and Constance presentations is this idea of, of data equity, uh, where there are real sort of lived experiences of people in different communities, but because it's not measured and, and represented in a particular way it's invisible to, to to planners to people in power to people who need to make decisions and by uh, doing the sort of mapping work that that constant was doing and doing the the um 
uh, mapping work that GoMetro did and doing the collection that you're doing now with, with Linto, there's a, a sort of an equity that's created uh, by, by making that lived experience uh, visible. Um, so I think there's a real there's a real power to that. Um, we've we've only got a sort of just over just short of fifteen minutes left, and I think there's a lot of of things to to be unpacked. There's a couple of questions in the chat box as well. Some of the questions in the chat box, I think, well, the one from Getty is around meeting cities where they are and whether or not the new approaches are influencing the administrations and how they actually function. And I think one of the questions I wanted to start with was, you know, how do we actually partner with local governments in delivering these types of solutions? So I think if anybody has a response to Getty's questions, they can um, they can build it into a response to that. Um, what's, what's quite clear is that even if we do all of this work outside of, of work with city governments, at some point, city governments have to respond by changing their policy on air pollution, by, by uh, actually adopting a particular technology into their operations, by responding to the data and the information in a particular way. And Richard, you mentioned some of your work you can't actually even show because it's seen as uh, very sort of internal to a, to a city system. Um, what are some of the lessons that can be shared with people in the audience around you know, how do you go about navigating that space? Rich, you spoke about there needs to be a demand pool. That demand pool might sometimes be from the local government itself, which then makes it relatively easy to partner with them. The demand pool is very much sitting in br the broader society and you're wanting local government to respond to that um, and you're hoping to influence them. It's a slightly harder process. Um, so, what are some of the lessons that can be shared in terms in terms of that? Um, I don't really have a particular person I'd want to spot, want to start with. Is there somebody who who is burning to start? Otherwise, I'll I'll pick on Constant is smiling, so I'm going to pick on Constant. Um, some lessons from you? No, it's uh, yeah, just a couple of things. You know, one or two things to mention. Um, being in the air quality space, you realize that it, that's sector falls under the environment department and from the experience in nairobi the environment department is already under a lot of pressure uh, as far as solid waste management is concerned you know garbage collection and, and the like so even when they budget for air quality monitoring or noise pollution monitoring you find that they end up being overridden by these other problems so they are always and that's why they are they are very warm towards um, people who are in this civic space and ready to to, to help them because they are already tied up with, with those those other problems. The challenge comes now when you highlight a story of a failure of government. That uh, becomes a challenge. And, but fortunately, it, it, the pressure is not necessarily at times on the director level, of the people, the level we're, of people we're talking with, but the pressure goes to maybe the governor level or the uh, cabinet secretary, what would the uh, county minister level or something like, or, or that particular level. That's where the pressure uh, to for application or for action goes to. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's 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 quite useful. So it, sometimes you have to highlight a failure, but maybe there's also an opportunity we're learning in there around can can you build a solution with or for uh, and empower them in a particular way? Um, then it might be easier. Uh, Rich, do you want to, to add to that? Mm. Yeah, and I think that that's a really great point. Um, you know, just on that, um, you sometimes, I think it's very much about understanding the ecosystem you're working in. So sometimes criticizing government actually gives agent actors within government a, a voice or, or, or space. Because I think one of the first things when you're talking about city and city government is that they're not homogenous. They're made up of a lot of different people and departments and silos and interests um and so a lot of our strategy and i think it aligns with what constant was saying was trying to find value exchange so how can you find the person that has a kpr they can't meet because they're missing some data or some information uh you know i think of the first example we came across which was um 
cities being asked to report on job creation, but they actually didn't have the data available to be able to understand job creation within the city environment. And um, so, so finding value exchange um, and finding champions um, and then setting your strategy approach is really important. So I think when it comes to partnering, you've got to decide whether you are working within the collaboration space with government uh, or in certain circumstances, you're working within the sort of activist space and both are important. And I think that's why the ecosystem of civil society and its engagement with civic tech is important. And sometimes you have to sort of take a multi multifaceted approach in terms of the way that you um, engage. But I think a lot of our, yeah, just a lot of our learnings is value exchange. So don't be extractive, even when it comes to government, like offer something, find a way, a place where there is a need or demand that you can provide value while getting sort of value back. Um, understanding the, the sort of, it's not homogenous. And so working out where criticism or pushing certain perspectives can build support. And um, uh, yeah, and, and I think, again, it's that maturity question. So how, how mature is the this, this sort of specific department, you, like government or government itself and its relationship with its city, its communities, its business community, its informal settlement, its informal community, if we want to call it that, or, um, because that'll give you your strategy on what lines you can walk. Um, I, I, I want to move on from this question because we're running out of time, but Wesley, if you want to bring an answer into it in the next question, you're welcome to. Um, something that, that I think about a lot, and Rich, we've had lots of conversations about this, is the potential to do harm with technology. Um, so in introducing um, uh, tools and systems in a, in a very rapid way or uh, exposing data that actually makes communities vulnerable because it, it you know, exposes private information or, or things like that, um, or being too technology led and that's actually solving the wrong problem and, and that sort of thing. So you know, how do we as, as civic technology players um, properly understand and, and analyze the, the risks associated with our work and enter into these spaces with the right amount of, of caution. And I, I want to go to you, Wesley, with, with, the, with the first answer to this, you introducing this new platform into, into, um, into Kai Mandi, and you've obviously done it with a fair amount of care, having this first phase being just asking people for something quite I want to say almost esoteric, <laughs> asking people just about their hopes and dreams rather than offering them a solution already. So take us through a little bit your thinking about that and 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 yeah, well, maybe some of the responses you've received as well about the broader vision that you have for, for, for that in terms of the potential um, dangerous side of coffee and two technology led. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question, which is very key. Um, I've, I've had the privilege of working very closely with the CEO of Cape Clouds open data, sort of, uh, let's say, officials or teams. And for me, that's been an interesting process, happy to what you're talking about. I mean, when we had the day zero water situation in Cape Town, there was a big issue about how do you go about releasing water data with a digital type of thing without releasing people's addresses for the state, you know? And so, 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 so there was a, an interesting thought process that went into that. And where I'm, where I'm getting to with this is that there's, there are a lot of lessons to learn from others that have improved this world. In other words, um, you know, there's some things that the city of Cape Town and Lance in the process of their open data, uh, you know, engagement and in Devon. To, to share these would, would, would assist, I think, um, in, in avoiding things that we, you know, at times we haven't even thought about. But I think this is part of the reason why we're approaching uh, this process in this way that we want to learn, but also um, base everything that we do on the experiences that we have. Uh, I want to just touch also on the point around, you know, ensuring that we, or just facilitating the process of accessing data, open data for, for, for government. I think Richard is correct when he says that 
government entities or government officials, departments are not the same. Just because you get joy from one, it doesn't mean you get joy from the other. I've learned that, for instance, politically, you know, some information is not going to be released because it's sensitive. Like financial data, for instance, I can tell you now, there was a case in Cape Town where some institutions um, were very happy to use the data that was released by the city of Cape Town around the finances. And thereafter, I learned that the, the officials that were kind of responsible for releasing that data were not that happy thereafter to release that data. So I'm just saying that one needs to just be conscious of those things, which is, of course, we would like to achieve our objectives. So those are the realities that people within the city or government entities are faced with in terms of policing that data. Because that, that data is still owned by you know different entities. So like it's owned by one single decision maker, you know. Yeah, so 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 those are just some of the points. I don't want to go on too long and realize it's limited time I like to Sure, thanks, yeah. Um Constance or Richard, have you got anything to, to add to that or a different perspective? How do we do, do no harm when working with, with data and introducing technologies to existing operating systems? Or I think, I mean, I think it's really tough. Um, and I think that there's a level of risk and you need a, you need a rubric for what the harm might be. And that's also hard to assess. But I mean, if you're talking about opening data around bus time, bus location and timetables and letting civic tech developers create a where's my bus app, I'm probably going to, you know, someone's probably going to find out the risk of that. Um, but for me, that's quite a low risk environment. And so something where you can innovate fast. But I mean, again, it's not about technology and big tech solutionist. It's got to be demand driven. It can't be like pushing a string. So, I mean, when you come to those principles that you have to bake in the do no harm into the design of the and understanding the user. So where the user is someone with a smartphone and they can find out where their bus is of, of an app. Cool. We've actually stopped programs because we've either or paused them or pivoted them because we found that either it's going to extend the digital divide so, so even though the information we're creating through a technology space is useful, it's probably going to, again, distort to those that have access um, uh, or, or, or trying to bring in regulatory and legal and policy side of things alongside data and tech and not letting the tech lead. So I think very much from our perspective, it's like, you know, as you said, like, don't there be tech a solution trying to find a problem to fit. Um, I think a lot of it's about understanding the problem uh, and, and then having that assessment of risk of what opening access to information or making people findable that are hidden or marginalized, what that could do. Um, and then empowering other sort of legal and activists and other groups to be kind of watchdogs in how information is used. Yeah. I do have a question for Constant on that note because, um, and, and, and where's in, I think like this is becoming, you know, things like WhatsApp and internet access are becoming more of a, um, less of an issue, but they're, they're still quite, I think quite a pervasive problem for us. And how do you, when you come to say like Nairobi and the census, how do you deal with things like, I mean, you know, how, and I'm, I'm sure there's like really great solutions but how do you get around the sort of internet access you know are the sensors offline and how are they updating um you know you know taking that i mean it's something we're trying to learn as well like how do you take that approach where what you create is actually not is sort of helping reduce that divide yeah that's a that's that's a critical a critical point that we we've, we've, been, we've thought about for quite some time and in that regard, we've developed different kinds of sensors. Um, we have sensors that work with uh, solar power and GSM. And the main reason for that is because uh, sometimes, you know, people, uh, the cost of power is quite high many times and people are initially enthusiastic about, you know, hosting them and then, you know, and they want to find ways of uh, cutting costs, you know, the sensor is going to be the first thing. Uh, the other, and 
and, and the same the same goes with at times Wi-Fi connectivity. Though we do we, we do also have some uh, AC and Wi-Fi power sensors, and, and with that regard, we uh, in hosting those we've partnered with you know community centers or places you know organizations that you know it will not impact on the expenses that that high. But it does become uh, you know you know at times a challenge, and you know one of the reasons why we shifted even to, to GSM, although we. Uh, to GSM was precisely because um, you know if you want to deploy a sensor uh, in a low-income community, maybe for a particular engagement, you know you can't really expect uh, to have you know uh, full-time Wi-Fi presence for sending data and, and such. It, it, I mean, it's, it's it's always going to be a an area that has its challenge, the challenges and solutions, but and you know it, it depends on each situation. Yeah, I think briefly for me, you know, I think the, the point was made about not always trying to do tech for tech's sake, you know, you know, even low tech solutions work. And uh, like one of, the, one of the challenges that we, we have, or at least the assumption is that everyone can act as an app. That's not true, you know, some people can't even load another app on their phone. So, you know, you don't want to always create an app. And hence, at least in this case, we have just a website. Um, just using Google Docs, for instance, is a basic thing to, you know, to get an understanding of people. But, you know, even paper sometimes text, you know, um, to, if you are very close to the community and, 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 and can engage with people and then use that information that you get in paper to translate it or to convert it to a uh, digital form. What I'm trying to really say is that we don't have to always push tech because we want to be <laughs> But uh, we can always use other means that are low tech. Um, and there's uh, also tools that we use in the system that are offline that can be transformed into online by But uh, yeah. yeah, thanks. Those are great responses. There's, um, there's a question from, from uh, Yasmin in the Q&A. Um, she says, noting the growing and important role of civic tech and broader tech, She's curious as to where the speakers see the scope and growth of civic tech in African cities, especially as it relates to public spaces and citizen engagement in those key spaces. So there's a couple of components there. Broadly, what is the scope and growth um, in African cities? So I guess she's asking you, what are your uh, um, hunches about the, the next sort of uh, frontier spaces? Um, are there... Are they, particular projects you excited to work on? Um, is the growth mainly with uh, uh, city government capabilities? Is it mainly with uh, you know community spaces? Is it on particular issues? And then there's a subcomponent to that, which is around you know opportunities in public spaces and city and citizen engagement within those public spaces. Um, I actually have a bit of a response to the public spaces one, but I'll let the speakers go first on the broader hunches and then add my two cents on the on the public spaces. Um, so, uh, yeah, Wesley, yeah, what are you so seeing me, on that? Yeah, if I may jump in here, that you know, without wasting too much time, really, you know, I foresee that um, you know you'll have two versions of uh, uh, community spaces. So if you have one township, you have a virtual version of that township uh, existing. And I think for me, that's the approach we to take because, um, you know, people talk about the metaverse. Yes, the metaverse in the US, yes, the metaverse in Europe. But I think in Africa, we ought to start with the basics. One, we've put out a physical environment. But if we are creating physical space, so virtual spaces, those should be spaces that replicate our community and ought to be seen as enablers the things that communities want. So I'm going to just stop there. I think that's where we, I think, see, you know, that's the direction we move towards. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, quite exciting. Um, uh, Constance, what do you think is the, the sort of next divisor? Well, I mean, definitely one of, with the uh, continuous urban growth and the necessity for more public space, the, the idea of just mapping out seeing using and using that data to identify uh, communities that are de deprived of, of public space and uh, communities that uh, need uh, 
more access to, to public space uh, is, is critical. Uh, but also looking at it, you know, from a from a more holistic holistic perspective of how communities can participate in urban design processes of uh, these uh, public space and of, of their cities, and how they can uh, be included, you know, how we can create more use civic tech for more democratic space beyond uh, just having that uh, data available. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I completely agree. I mean, I just, I think one of the, in terms of this topic, I mean, there's a tech solutionist answer, which is going to mention 4IR and blockchain and all these kind of things, but I don't think that's the way to, that's what excites me. I think what excites me is the idea of raising the ocean. Um, so what is, you know, so as he's saying, like there's this digital community, so urban space and placemaking. There's a lot of work to be done in, in the marriage between that and civic tech and data still in my mind and sort of the space of what is actually a city um, and it's digital, digital sovereignty, it's data sovereignty, it's idea around community connection and the social fabric that you want it to be and citizen enabled, citizen led, resident led decision making um, that is going to be more seamless between the digital and the physical space and both must be understood um and so digital infrastructure is public infrastructure um but i think a lot of what we're focusing on is is also this idea around bringing like government on the journey um we've got to understand we're working in a contested space and a lot of that sort of stuff needs systems and sort of to Geshe's question um, sort of needs the way that city administration works and the way that, you know, those things, you know, Jody, this thing we've been talking around where we're coming out of ecosystems where all technology and data and digital has been owned by IT departments within cities and the need for there to be digital, which is different to data, which is different to technology as transversal, you know, empowered things within city government systems, and maybe a kind of a mirror of that within community, um, for us to get to this point where the sort of citizen participation and del like deliberation and tracking government and other infrastructure development and spending and voting and all these sorts of things start to become, um, super inclusive and that's exciting so i think the if the frontier for me is the is the is the community we want to be you know like that's the sort of vision um tech will enable that to some degree um yeah um so i'm gonna break from my only facilitator role and just share i was working on a project recently and it's one of these ways sort of one of the one of the input criteria is inverted commas smart city and and people were listing all of the things that 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 need to be there for it to be a smart city and a, a lot of it was like you know digital sign boards and everything has to have like qr codes and there's apps for absolutely every, every experience is a has has an app linked to it and everything um and and i, I don't think that that's quite the the right the right direction i think a lot of people especially if you're going to like a beautiful public space maybe i'm speaking for myself but actually the last thing i want to do when i'm in a beautiful public space is constantly be on my phone <laughs> i want to actually be in the beautiful public space um enjoy enjoying it and uh, you know like breathing the fresh air and taking my shoes off and all of all of those things so if you want a beautiful public space you want you want it to be safe you want it to be well programmed with nice activities you wanted to be regularly cleaned and proactively maintained and easy to access and and all of these things and those things can be achieved and made more efficient and, and the sort of back end operational systems that enable all of those things can have digital solutions and those digital solutions can exist some of them entirely on city government operational systems and some of them actually require citizen engagement and citizen input and that citizen engagement and citizen input might exist on a neighborhood platform 
where there's this kind of co-design and collaboration, but you would do that, you know, when you get home back to your couch, not when you're actually in the public space. And some of it you might do when you're in the public space to kind of quickly point something out or tap something to rate it or, or something like that. Um, but it's but it's going to be as kind of easy and seamless as, as possible. It's not going to be, and it's all, you know, with the purpose on, of enabling those outcomes. It's not an extra layer of digital experience in the place, if, if, if I can if I can put it that way. Um, so yeah, that's that's I think what 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 it is, what what it is about, and it's about making those things actually work and and ideally um, cost our city governments less, um, so that they can do more uh, for for us. Yeah. Um, I think we we are well. I don't think I, I know that we are uh, over time. Um, there is another. There are a couple more questions here. Um, I think there's a, a question from Kirsten that we haven't answered. Or is it, I think it's just a, more of a comment from Kirsten. Um, I'm not sure. I think we've kind of addressed this. Yeah, um, Richard has responded. I think we've mainly. I think I think it's more of a comment. Um, yeah, I think I think maybe we can move move to closing, uh, given we over time and people probably want to grab a cup of tea before you move to the next session if you are staying on for the next sessions. So um, Yasmin, if you can put up the uh, slides for the next speakers. Thanks very much to, to Wesley, Constant, and Richard for joining us. You're all doing such interesting work. <laughs> I get to dip in, in and out of it, but I'm very envious that for the three of you, it's actually you know your day jobs and consuming all of your time. I uh, very much appreciate you taking time out of that to share with the audience uh, today. Um, the next uh, events today, there's three more sessions. Um, uh, Yasmin, are you going to take us through the through the sessions for the rest of today? Oh, she's okay. She's got trouble with being muted. Um, we've we've got uh, we've got a session with you, you. Can go to your your schedule and check what the the later sessions are. Um, We've got a deep dive uh, coming up. Um, and then if you can go to the next one. Um, we've got one on shifting our relationship uh, with technology. Um, and then we've got MIT and community-focused tech entrepreneurship also later this afternoon. Uh, so those are the, the sessions that are, are coming up this afternoon. Thanks very much, everyone, for, for joining. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you.